This is Dib Tech Talk, a show where we make sense of all things cybersecurity for the defense industrial base. You don't have to sell arms to an embargoed country to violate the Arms Export Control Act. The International Traffic and Arms Regulations, also known as the ITAR, implements the Arms Export Control Act. The ITAR authorizes the president to control the export and import of defense articles and defense services. Any person who violates any provision of the ITAR faces civil and or criminal penalties for violations. Stay tuned as I chat with an ITAR expert to learn more about how you can stay out of jail and avoid massive fines. I started my career with McDonnell Douglas way back in the 70s. My grandfather worked there. <laughs> Long Beach and... I got to I got to see a lots of products and working on the space station program and a, and a couple of DoD programs. Um, that's where I was introduced to the ITAR actually way way back. Um, I started working it full time uh, in the in the 90s and uh, was on lab with uh, JPL for seven years. I was with one of the larger multinational um, inspection service companies. We had 56 locations in the U.S. and I was responsible for export control there. Participated on a couple of uh, DDTC compliance audits for, you know, the get well plans due to consent agreements and so on and so forth. So I've just been doing this an awful long time. I'm one of those nerds who likes to read the regs on Saturdays. That's my Saturday reading. Um, I'm, I'm constantly participating in the DDTC conversations and I, uh, I can't get enough of it. So it's one of these that I like this stuff. So um, it was awesome for you to invite me. I, I appreciate the opportunity to participate. Yeah, no, Mark, thank you so much for, for joining me. I too am a, I come from the world of policy. I've been doing DOD policy for, I don't know, the last 10 years. And so when the CMMC happened, I, I would, <laughs> every time a document would drop, I would take, I would print it, read it, highlight it, exactly. underline it, make arrows. Um, so, and, and I, I do that with CUI policy also. So I, I really appreciate your um, nuanced understanding of all of these regulations. So can you please explain what ITAR stands for? Um, who owns it? Where did it, like, what does it exist for? What it, is the ITAR? It exists, it's, ITAR is the international, uh, it's the international regulations for munitions. It controls all of the international traffic and arms regulations. It's the implementing regulations to the Arms Export Control Act. So you have the law, the act, and then you have the implementing regulations, the ITAR. So think of the ITAR as the ISO so that you are compliant with the, the Arms Export Control Act. So the law stipulates that the president has the authority to regulate imports and exports. He delegated that authority to the DDTC, which is out of the State Department. So that's where we get those, those regulations. And the DDTC is a branch of, of the State Department. It's got quite a few employees in there. They're a great group of professionals, both civilians and military. Um, they are the experts in there. So if you've ever got a question on your defense article, they are great to contact and they'll work with you on it. But that's where it stems from. So it's, it's the law, then the implementing regulations. And it's one of those, start with the definitions. I will tell anybody who was interested in ITAR, read the definition section first, part 120. <laughs> right. So what is what is the goal of ITAR? Like, uh, so the president can regulate exports, right. and this is him. Re this is regulating exports. <clears throat> but what are we regulating here? What it, it's is the, the, the goal is it's part of foreign. It's part of national security. We want to protect U.S. assets from from enemies, if you will. So there's a lot of technology and knowledge and, and the artifacts themselves, and it's just part of the foreign foreign policy. So we want to protect national security. We want to make sure that. Um, Companies that build widgets, defense widgets, um, they don't inadvertently send those out to con to countries or persons that are on the you know the denied parties list and so on and so forth. So it's to protect the national interests and national security. Okay, so so we have these laws that you know govern the export um, of certain types of data, so that doesn't end up in the hands of the wrong people. Right. So what are uh, and I guess we can jump right into some of the specific questions that seem, mm -hmm. people seem to have. Um, or does it make sense to to talk about the fundamental handling requirements of it? Well, there's. it's funny. When you talk about the ITAR, people sometimes draw a line between the actual hardware and the technical data. And I think what we were talking about is the control of the technical data. When you look at the ITAR regulations and the definitions, technical data is considered a defense article. 
just the same. We have to control that the same as we do the actual hardware. So if you have a widget, you'll have the technical data that tells you how to design, manufacture, test, repair that widget. That's the technical data. That's the knowledge we want to control. So when you look at technical data, it's, it's anything that tells you how to do those functions as a manufacturer or a testing house or a repair house. <clears throat> okay. That makes sense. So and, I have a question about the oh, technical data. Okay. So um, I'm not sure if you read the CUI policies in this with the same fervor that you read your ITAR policies. Right. Um, but so the CUI program has been around for 10 years. DOD has only recently adopted it. So there's kind right. of this learning curve on figuring out how CUI works uh, specifically for the DOD. So how does it in the CUI registry? Um, it gives you uh, marking and labeling right. uh, requirements for CUI. And so I, in the export control category, the export control markings is um, EXPT, right? Correct. And it doesn't really indicate any anything further. So where do people go to figure out how to mark their export control? That's, that's a great question. One, you always want to follow those, those marketing requirements. But two, when it comes to the ITAR technical data, one of the things that the State, State Department recommends, and when you're talking from player to player, so prime to supplier and so on, we want to make sure that, say, for the drawings, that we also identify what's called the, the USML category, the United States Munitions Slips category. So let's take, for instance, we're, we're building a small part component or accessory for an aircraft. Well, the USML category for that is category H. I mean, sorry, category eight. And within that, there is a subcategory H. And that's what you want to look for is you give them that specific category so they, they know what they're handling. Um, most, in most cases, what we see, Leslie, is from supplier to down the chain, they have a global stamp that says, this is export controlled, and it may be EAR or it may be ITAR. Um, that's nice. It tells them they have to control it, but it's not doesn't tell them exactly what artifact they're dealing with. So that's where the, the State Department says you want to make sure that everybody in the food chain understands the USML category and subcategory. So it's always a good idea to mark the drawing with that as well. So whose responsibility is it to market and so so if I'm a sub and my prime just tells me that this is all ITAR and then that's it. Are they supposed to then tell me what the articles right. are, or am I supposed to figure this out? Who, you know, who's on the hook here for doing all that? Aha! Uh -huh. There's there's the question that everybody asks, and what it, it typically belongs to the to the person that has design cognizance. So they've got the design characteristics. That's where you make your classification. If an item is specially designed and then enumerated for you know military application it's going to be ITAR and you're going to see it listed there. But the person who makes the, who has the design cognizance should be making that. Most of the time, that's not what happens. A small machine shop will get, oh, we need you to build this. And then they say, well, Mr. Customer, what's the ITAR classification? They say, I don't know, but it's for a, it's for a, it's a tank and it does this, this, and this. Then typically the manufacturer is required to keep records of everything that they make under the ITAR and they should keep those records. So typically it's going to fall on that person there. That's the that's the same guidance from CUI. The person who's creating that CUI, that authorized holder right. of that information is responsible at the time of creation to designate it as CUI. So same yep. responsibility here. Exactly. So what you're telling me is that if somebody is handing me drawings or schematics or some sort of technical data that they have told me is ITAR, they should have labeled it. They should have labeled it. And typically we... At Aerospace Exports, we, we suggest to our customers that we give them a questionnaire. And it's, it's very simple. You follow it through. And the questionnaire is designed to, one, determine have they do they understand the classification? And two, do they understand the export controls? Because sometimes, actually, people will put, no, it's not ITAR controlled, and no, it's not EAR controlled. And we know it's going to be one of the, one of the two. It has to be. So... Um, we ask them to fill it out. If they don't fill it out, that's where the person building it now has to do their homework. <clears throat> All right. Okay. So the person's done their homework. They figured out uh, what type of ITAR it is. They, um, they're creating these, um, this technical data. How, what are the handling requirements of that technical data? Now okay. that we know that we have it, we know what kind it is, and we know for certain it's export controlled. So the, the company typically, if they're handling 
ITAR technical data, they should have what's called a technology control plan in place. And what that does is it tells the entire organization how to handle it, including um, who has access. So uh, without prior authorization, U.S. citizens and green card holders, in other words, U.S. persons, have access to technical data that's ITAR controlled. And a U.S. person is either a, uh, a green card holder or a citizen, so that could be both. A U.S. person is also a company um, incorporated to do business in the United States and so on and so forth. So the TCP tells them it's going to be U.S. persons who can have access unless you have authorization. And the State Department provides that authorization through what's called a licensing program. So it's called the DSP-5, and it's a, uh, a, a, a permanent export license to the country from where that person is a citizen. So let's say we had somebody working from England on, on a work visa. They're not a U.S. person, but they're a critical engineer. We'd go to the State Department, get a DSP-5. That would give them authorization to look at that technical data. Okay. Do you know how long that process takes or how difficult It's actually that is? fairly quick. State Department's gotten so fast at this, and the new DEC system has made it so much easier for the applicants to process their licensing. Um, if it's not a super sensitive, what's called a significant military item, um, it's not going to take that long. It's going to maybe be, be anywhere from 7 to 13 days. If it's a very significant, highly sensitive item, it might take quite a bit longer, but it's usually not very long at all. And wow. it, obviously the country has some bearing on that as well. <clears throat> right. So what if they are a citizen of a country that we wouldn't want to necessarily have a permanent export? There's where, there's where it gets. If, if they're here... And there are certain, there are certain, what is it? As a part of the check, you've got to give that person their former home address and all of that kind of information. So there's, there's quite a bit of background that goes on that the State Department does when they check this out. So there are some countries that, you know, obviously have, you know, presumed to be denied. And if they're still a citizen, if they still have family ties there, um, that's going to make it more difficult to get authorization. Okay. All right, so they have to be a U.S. person to be granted access to the information. So how is access defined? Oh, that's a great question. So there's two things. It's called releasing and versus access. And access is where you give the, it's the technology term for actually giving them permission via a password or the encryption key and so on and so forth. Releasing it is actually giving them the visual, releasing the drawing in front of them and letting them look at it visually having them actually touch the widget, uh, doing oral exchanges, written exchanges. So you can release the item in, in many different ways. And uh, quite often, sometimes this happens over, over the um, meetings where they're having conference calls and so on and so forth. In fact, just a few years ago, a very large prime, they, they held a conference call. And, and I always stress that when we're doing a conference call in which we may be discussing technical data, we want to confirm that only U.S. persons are on the call. Um, and in that particular instance, they didn't confirm it until afterward. They found out there was somebody who was not a U.S. person, and oops, we have a violation. So, <clears throat> I had a similar incident um, in a training class. Uh, there was an intelligence community. Uh, we have something similar. It's um, you know, oh, obviously no foreign, uh, some classification markings. Uh, and we had an Aussie in the class, and I guess the instructor forgot that we had an Aussie in the class. Um, he took diligent notes as soon as he saw the slide. And uh, <laughs> you know, well, it, it's one of those. And, and when these things happen, you you look at it and go, okay, would they would they have granted access through an authorization? Obviously, you want to do a voluntary disclosure as soon as possible uh, before the government finds out about it, so that it, it's it's you know it helps everyone out. <laughs> So what's a voluntary disclosure? That's where if an organization's discovered that they may or they've confirmed that they have a violation to the ITAR and it hasn't been uh, uh, noticed or acknowledged by the any of the U.S. governments, you can go as a, as a U.S. person, as a company and say, you know what, we think we've failed. This is where we failed. You let the State Department know about it. You obviously prepare all your corrective actions, show them how it happened, why it happened. And hopefully it would have been, had you done a license, uh, license application, it would have been approved. But it's a way to show the State Department, yep, your export compliance system's in place. 
you've got controls, you notice there was a failure, and you've closed that loophole. But that's notification to the State Department that you did have a suspect violation. And do they punish you? Well, you know, the State Department's very good about it. If you're if 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 you do things right and you're and and you follow detailed processes and you've got a good corrective action system in place, they're usually pretty good about saying, okay, they'll look at it, they'll evaluate it. Um, and it is part of the what he considered mitigating if you're doing the voluntary and you're telling them everything up front. Um, but if you've shown that you've got a good handle, you've got your data there, typically they tell you, don't do it again. We're going to watch you for a year and then, you know, go away. The, the, the worst I've ever seen this happen, we, we got the call, um, you know, uh, a very large prime called and said, hey, we need you to go help with this fastener company in California. They think they had a violation. So we went in. We talked to the vice president of sales. And by the way, I got to tell your listeners, vice presidents of sales can never be the empowered official. They can never be the gatekeeper for ITAR. They shouldn't. Never, never. It's a conflict of interest. So this person had been submitting DSP-5 applications to export uh, defense articles. Um, the State Department <laughs> had actually been denying the applications. And he had been exporting anyway. Uh, by the time we were done with our uh, audit, we found 1,700 violations. Um, <clears throat> and what are what are each violation? Like, so what, the violation what? was every time you illegally exported that, that was one transaction. Um, he had been doing this over the number of years. So the company was, oh my goodness, they wanted to do things right. They immediately um, dismissed the person. And, and it we of course, we got the lawyers involved and we flew out and talked to the State Department. And it was one of those that it was, you know, taking binders of evidence to say, this is what we've done to get better. And they literally they literally said, OK, we're going to watch you. We're not going to fine you, which was we between the lawyer and I, we had a, a side bet going on how much the fine was going to be. But the State Department was pretty good about it. But they just said, don't bring that person back. You know, that person's yeah, so released. Did, you face, did that person, did that individual face any fines or? That we didn't know. Once they were dismissed from the company, uh, it's kind of like, I'm okay. <laughs> but um, that person, as far as I know, was never, nothing ever happened to him. I think it was, so I don't happens, know if it was out of negligence or ignorance or what, but. Yeah. So what happens if State Department would have come in and said, we have evidence of 1,700 violations and you didn't tell us? What can state do to you then? Well, see, there's where the, the the investigation has to show whether it was willful or by an accident. Um, and and that's why the State Department and the Commerce Department, the BIS, both re really stress the company should have good export compliance programs in place. There should be an audit group that's independent of the of the empowered official. Empowered officials should have the full authority to be able to stop things from going out the door. They can stop... POs from going out, releasing RFQs. I mean, even sending the wrong proposal, sending a proposal to the wrong person could be a violation. So people have to be thoroughly trained. The management has to totally back that technology control plan. And that way you keep that. And it's basically just a good compliance program. But if they see that it's willful, that's where the fines go higher. And there's probably going to be somebody that's going to go spend some time behind bars. But typically, it's going to be not willful. It'll be more of a civil penalty. And yeah, you're going to get fined. In fact, that's one of the things I like to watch is the State Department's list of major compliance issues and the Commerce Department's issues. In fact, on the Commerce side, what did they just hit? A company down in Florida for $42,000 for, for not classifying the parts correctly, essentially. So, <clears throat> Wow. So what is involved in having a, quote, good... Um, compliance program? Program. Mm -hmm. First of all, you've got to have management has to be trained and you have to assign at least one person from the State Department is considered, the State Department considers it an empowered official. And that person has to know and understand the various statutes and regulations for criminal penalties and so on and so forth. So it's the empowered official has to be very knowledgeable. They need to have read the regulation. It's amazing to me how many companies I go into and they say, well, I've been registered for five years. I said, great. What does part 130 stand for? I don't know. Okay. You've never. So it's having a compliance training in place, making sure that um, they understand how to do customer screening, how to do supplier screening, 
and how to make sure that they analyze those transactions so that they don't inadvertently have an escape. Um, and training all of their employees, the general employees, even the employees down on the floor, need to understand how to control technical data. We had a, a, a small uh, heat treat shop in Southern California, and in Southern California during the summer, it gets a little warm. And this company thought, well, it was great. We're going to have the ice cream man walk through the shop and sell ice creams. <laughs> and it was an ITAR controlled shop. <laughs> So there was someone who really didn't understand English walking through and seeing lots of DOD projects. Yeah. So what are some of those um, ITAR controlled requirements for a space that's handling ITAR? Um, is it, I imagine it's similar to, to the CUI requirements, like having a controlled space where visitors are escorted. Um, can they have as a uh, non-U.S. person visitors in this space or is it? Sure, they can. It's just don't release the the, the okay. technology to them. Don't if if they're going to take a walk through the floor, and let's say across the floor there there's there's part of a an aircraft for an F-15 or a B-1, they can walk. They just don't take them over there and let them pick it up and do a visual inspection. Um, technical data should be locked up. Your servers obviously have to be U.S. based, controlled and manned and maintained by U.S. persons. You cannot just send that out to anybody in the cloud and say, I'm going to use the, the least expensive cloud services in Pakistan. It's not going to work. You want to make sure that it's in the United States. <clears throat> okay. So in the United States, maintained by a U.S. person. Um, and only accessed only by, US, by U.S. persons, right. Okay. All right. That makes sense. So what else? I feel like there's... Um, yeah, what else, what, are you, what do you find that people most often mess up when it comes to ITAR? <laughs> or like um, mis misunderstand? The, the, or... The, the, the thing that scares me the most is when a tier three supplier sends a drawing straight across the email to a tier four without being encrypted. They have no okay. idea about encryption technology, what they have to do, and they just keep sending things back and forth. And then someone say takes their laptop to Mexico in California, a lot of people go to Mexico and they don't have that secure and it, they don't keep the laptop with them and they just don't understand the protocols involved. <clears throat> so what are, what would be the protocols, let's say traveling with a laptop with ITAR data on it? Um, what are, what would be the requirements? I mean, can you take First of all, I, first of all, I wouldn't, I okay. wouldn't. I just recommend take, take what's called a travel laptop. Don't have any of the ITAR data on there. Uh, it's the safest thing. But if you are if you are a U.S. person and you're traveling, what what has to happen is you don't release that to a foreign person. Now the concern is um, there are some rules and regulations. In other words, the ITAR states that it's not an export event if you're doing things encrypted and it's going from U.S. person to U.S. person. However, there are certain countries where they say we just don't want you to do that. Don't go there. Don't take that. There are embargoed countries and. And obviously, there are some countries where they expect espionage to happen. So our recommendation is take a scrub laptop. If you are going to do it, follow the protocols and make sure that nobody can inadvertently see that. Uh, no foreign persons can inadvertently have access. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the encryption and how if data is encrypted and it may be outside the United States, but it, that doesn't constitute a release? Yeah, so right. if, if let's say a, a U.S. person is, um, one company's got a, a facility overseas, um, and they've got a U.S. person that's going over there, and they send something over. So they want to make sure that they follow the encryption requirements. So that's just, um, as a part of that, we want to make sure that you follow the FIPS 140-2 um, standard. And that um, for, for the encryption, it's going to be an AES 128-bit minimum. Um, you can exceed that, but following those protocols is what you need to do. <clears throat> so um, this came up a question the other day. Can a non-U.S. owned company that is doing business in the United States, that's a defense contractor, can they right. handle ITAR? Ah, great question. So it's when you say, um, so it's a U.S. company. I mean, it's a business, it's a business in the United States, but it has foreign management. It's foreign controlled. Where yes, more it's own, like uh, I, I would assume the CEOs like from are, from yeah. Singapore or something like that right. it happens all the time. And again, in California, um, yes, they can be DDTC registered. 
Now, in one case, we have this. We have a company up in San, uh, San Jose that's a client. The CEO and president is not a U.S. person. She's not allowed on the production floor. She's, she's ITAR restricted on her server for certain drawings. So absolutely, that can happen. And that's where the TCP is a really, it's really important. And the person who is the supervisor of the non-US persons, those are the persons that you need to stress the most knowledge with of being careful how they speak with their subordinates that are non-US persons if they don't inadvertently provide them access or release the information. But yes, there are US-based companies that are foreign controlled that are DDTC registered, but only US persons can apply for an application and be DDTC registered. For, there are some instances where others can do that, but typically it's just gonna be a US person. Okay, so you keep saying DDTC registered. So yeah. does every company who handles ITAR, do they have to be DDTC registered? If, if they are manufacturing a defense article, um, then they, they, they are required per the ITAR to be DDTC registered as a manufacturer. Now, is every company but registered? What if they're no. not manufacturers? What if they're not? What if they're what if they're what if they're like um, design engineers or something, and they're just designing the parts, and then they're sending it out to a different company for manufacturing? Okay, there are there are, there's there's very specifics for that on on what kind of manufacturer, but it's it's the person actually manufacturing that widget. Obviously, there are companies that they just deal in certain creating technical data that there are exceptions to that but if you're a widget manufacturer and you are you're creating even the smallest fastener maybe for the B2 you're going to be and even though you may never export you're going to be need, you're going to need to be registered and i can send you the the specifics on what constitutes it and there are exceptions so um and right now there are only 14,000 companies registered with the DDTC so you tell me how many how does that match the manufacturers out there that are probably really doing defense articles. Yeah, I've I've heard somewhere that there's uh, about thirty thousand manufacturer manufacturers in the defense industrial base. So right. I would imagine um, more than half of them are probably doing this. Right. Interesting. Um, so, what does it? What are? What is the DT DDTC registration process look like? Okay. It's, it's an application process where they go through and it's just a formal application that you, that you process through the DEC system, their online system. And essentially what they're doing is they're asking for the corporate officers. They want their background information. They want information about the company. So if the company's publicly traded, um, the, the DDTC will work with, with other agencies to make sure that the information they got was accurate and truthful. Um, they're going to ask you about what kind of art, what what defense articles are you manufacturing? Have you ever done it in the past? And one of the questions was, are you doing this because you had a voluntary you had a violation? But they're going to ask you the questions about the company. Do you have a program in place? But essentially, what they want is the background of the officers, and they want to know who the empowered official is going to be, and pay your fee, and you're on your way. <clears throat> so, do you have to? Like have a defense contract already in place to be no. DDTC registered? No, you just... that's, that's a great question. You don't have to have a, a DOD contract in place. Um, it's, and most, uh, I would say a lot of the smaller ones do this just in case. They want, you know, they'll get an RFP from, from Raytheon or somebody and say, well, you've got to be DDTC registered even to, a, to be a participant or send in. And that's what they do. But um there are some that do it, they work with it, and they don't necessarily like going through the hoops of maintaining all of those records. And then they resign from being a DVT, from a, being a defense article manufacturer, which is like, okay. <clears throat> so how do I prove my DD, DD? Do I need to prove to um, my prime contractor that I'm DDTC registered <coughs> or do I need to make sure my suppliers are? Like, how does that work? Where does that responsibility? Okay. So when you are registered, you will get a letter from the state, from the DDTC stating, and it'll have your, what's called your M number, your manufacturer's number, that number. And it shows that you're registered for a year and it's good for 12 months. So it's got when you were registered and obviously when it's going to expire, but it, it'll have your M number on it. Now, most companies, what they do is they take that letter and they, they send it to their customers. But the State Department has published uh, on their website that you need to make sure that you keep that M number uh, private. That's proprietary. It's like your Social Security number. So 
Um, we always recommend to all of our clients, black that out, send it in. Obviously, it's on DDTC letterhead, um, and, that, and that works really well. And a lot of companies, what we're seeing now is the primes are now sending notes to the sub-tier saying, hey, we notice you're about to expire. Make sure to send us that new letter. <clears throat> so what about these like small, like, you know, tier two suppliers who have, you know, they're tier three suppliers. Um, do these people generally, like, they're supposed to just track it on their own? <laughs> like, well, you know, one of the things we, have, we, we right. recommend is that you, you maintain a list of the, of the qualified suppliers, just like you would for ISO. And you keep a okay. copy of the DDC registration. But the small houses, somebody that's going to be five persons or less, they're typically not going to spend that $2,250 a year just to be DDTC registered. Now, they obviously, they lowered the fees during the, during the pandemic. But when that goes back to the normal fee, that's a pretty hefty chunk for a small machine shop or a, a Deber shop or something like that. But typically, those guys aren't doing it. And that's, that's been the frustration for the Tier 3 groups because they can't find anybody lower down the chain that really wants to be registered. Yeah. So does it count as a, um, a spill or a, a violation if you send ITAR to somebody whose DDT, DDTC registration expired or is not? Okay. Registered? So section 127 of the ITAR <laughs> is the violations. And it calls out, if you willfully know that you're sending a defense article to someone who's not authorized, uh, including not DDTC registered for manufacture, that's a willful violation. Okay. What so, if you didn't know? Well, your export compliance program said you should know before you did that. Okay, so there's no claiming <laughs> ignorance here. Well, you can if you're brand new, and but I wouldn't, I wouldn't get DDTs registered and then try to, you know, shore it all up. I'd have everything in place, then apply for it because. One of the things that they ask for in the application is, can you? Sometimes they ask for you to supply the TCP, and <laughs> you don't want to have to draft that real fast. But yeah, it happens. Sometimes they forget. Is there a template for a um, a technical control plan? Yeah, yeah, there is, and you can have anybody email me, and I'll send I'll send it to them complimentary. It's not a problem. But there's not like a state department. No. One or a NIST one that's out no, there. No, because then around. if they give you that, you follow it and something goes wrong, who are you going to blame? Well, NIST has a templated <laughs> system security plan. Well, NIST has a, a, of us Exactly. Yeah. Well, no comment. So what else is asked in the DDTC application? Do you know? <sighs> well, let's see. So the persons, what were, where they were born, their, their um, you know, if... Um, their address, social security number, blah, blah, blah. Um, they ask for the companies. Like, well, they, they, so they, they, may ask for the, they may ask for the TCP, but they're not going to ask for any other procedures. Um, they are going to ask you for your uh, articles of incorporation, you know, your, your permission to do business in, in whatever city or state. So they're going to ask for that. <clears throat> okay. um, and other than that, there aren't, there aren't any other artifacts that you have to present. So actually, everybody who's going through that, you're giving them all of their information, you know, driver's license, social security, all that junk. <clears throat> so there's no requirement to have like a to prove that you have a management training program or, you know, nope. prove the qualifications of the empowered person. No, nope. but that doesn't mean after you're registered, you might not get a visit just hmm. to say hi. What are these visits? How, do they, how often do they do these visits? Well, you know. a visit usually happens when they suspect something's going wrong. Um, at least the ones that I've participated on. Um, somebody, something's happened and they just drop by and, and there happens to be a government official in the area. And they want to introduce you to the ITAR and EAR and give your management a quick half hour briefing on this. So, um, oh yeah. Sounds nice. <laughs> Sounds like it, it does. It does. And, and it's one of those that make sure that you're ready to go. Versus the other door, and, and, and unfortunately, I've, I've received the phone calls. Um, I was, uh, as, as a part of being an empowered official for that larger organization, I received a phone call from a, a quality manager uh, back east who said, Mark, you'd be proud. The State Department showed up and I didn't let them in. And I was like, what? <laughs> so they wanted to talk to me. I was like, well, we always want to cooperate. Why wouldn't you? You know, they came because they think they have a problem over there. So 
Um, always, anytime you get a government visitor in there, always let them in, but always have two people in your company, obviously, in the conversation, someone you take in your record of discussion. That's, um, yeah, no, <laughs> really good tidbit, good advice. Let the government in, <laughs> but be yeah, prepared. It's, it's, you know. <laughs> That's funny. Um, well, this was, so I didn't know that they did visits. Um, is it, so during these visits, do they ask for, like, do they verify anything or are they just kind of well, like, they're, okay, they, 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 they sure. the ones that I participated on, they've talked to the, ex, the, the compliance officials and senior management and just asked them general questions about the ITAR, about the regulations. And what amazes me is, say, a general manager of a facility just having that wide eyed deer during the headlights look. And even though they may have been just recently trained, they can't. But if they can pull it up and show it. But um, typically, like I said, these visits are because something else is going on. But um, there are there there are those compliance visits where they're just trying to promote and, and and get the information out there. So it's always great. And and anytime the state state department is very good about hosting different kinds of events and I encourage people to those are free it's it's an excellent source of information so I don't want to talk on this too long but it but we've talked about it or you brought it up a couple of times so I want to make sure that we at least address this acronym um, EAR what is the difference between ITAR and EAR um, okay yeah, and, and how so are they the same? The EAR is the Export Administration Regulations, and they handle everything else that the ITAR and other agencies don't handle. So the, the ITAR handles basically the military applications, things that are specifically enumerated on the USML. Um, if it's not on the USML and it's a general commodity, it's going to fall to the EAR. And that's what's called, it, it's, it's, uh, it's the control list for that. So it's the the commerce control list for every other kind of commodity. Now, what is interesting was a few years ago, um, the ITAR went through kind of some modifications and they wanted to help reduce the stress on the ITAR manufacturers. So they kind of put a higher wall around a smaller amount of items. So they moved some of the items from the ITAR over to the EAR and they created what's called the Series 600 for what's called the Export Classification Control Numbers, ECCNs. They created six Series 600 for military items that aren't controlled by the ITAR. So the EAR controls everything else. So everything from materials, raw materials, widgets, commercial. So it's, it's typically for items that were designed predominantly for a commercial application. And do they have stricter regulations about export? No, they have that. They it's the EAR is a it's it's much much more to read, um, but it's very very detailed. And what I would stress anybody who's reading one or the other, be very careful to read the words and read the definitions. A part is a part according to ITAR. It's not necessarily according to what you consider a part. And there's very specific definitions for that. So if if what you're looking for isn't enumerated in the ECCN or the USML, then it's going to drop out. So um, most of the items are covered under the EAR. And what's funny, Leslie, is companies say, well, I don't have to worry about controlled items because I do commercial. A lot of commercial items have control where it may require a license to export those items, even though it's a commercial item. Yeah, interesting. And that's, you pointed out, you made a good point that if it's not explicitly enumerated in the USML or the um, uh, e ECCN, that it right. is not export controlled. Same with well, CUI. Well, it's export controlled, but it's not going to be, it's not, so let me, uh, okay. so there's yes. USML and then there's an ECCN, okay. which is on the commercial control list, the commerce okay. control list. If it's not enumerated on the on, as an ECCN, then it's going to be designated what's called EAR 99. And typically that means okay. no license required. <clears throat> See, but it's the, still export control? It's still controlled, but there's no there, but there's the reasons for control, there really aren't any. So let's say there was an ECCN. What you do is the the, the the commerce control list has what's called a country control chart. So you look up the ECCN, you look at the reasons for control, and they have codes. So one of the codes may be AT, anti-terrorism. 
If, it, if there was an AT code, you look down to the country that you want to export. If there's no X in that country for AT, you don't need a license. If there's an X there, you're going to need a license or you need to look for an exemption. It's, it's kind of like doing a puzzle. Yeah, no, that makes, that makes sense. And is there anywhere, or is there any training out there that like these manufacturing companies who are now beholden to the whole ITAR who, you know, are, are going to be hung out to dry if they violate this either willfully right. or un, you know, unknowingly, how do they get educated on all of this? Well, there's, the government has some, obviously the, the Commerce Department has has sessions that, that they offer for the EAR. The State Department has sessions. Um, there are also a lot of great conferences out there that they can do. Um, the Society for International Affairs, um, they offer a lot of great training as well. I mean, that's a great, for somebody who's brand new to this, I would definitely recommend that they look to that because they can buy handbooks and so on and so forth. Um, obviously, they can call us, but there are a lot of opportunity out there. And and frankly, if you just got a, one of the things that when I when I was in this business, started in this, it was like trying to get help was hard. Uh, typically, mm -hmm. you had to talk to a lawyer or something like that. And it's like, okay, well, but no if somebody has a general comment, we're always there to say, Okay, here's our answer to the specific question. We're, we'll be glad to help. If it runs into more, then we can talk to you about becoming a client. But there's a lot of training out there, and obviously, um, the uh, there's conferences. There's a lot of conferences that you can do. Um, it's great for a newbie to go to these ITAR conferences, and they come back and they've got a giant binder, and they go, "Okay, we don't know where to start." But they just, you know, I'd start with starting the definitions, read the definitions in both the EAR and the ITAR first, and then start kind of, you know, going through what it takes to authorize something to go out. But, you know, obviously they can give us a call and send us an email and we'll be glad to help them. This is very much a fire hose for me. Um, I really appreciate this. Thank you so much for your time. No, my pleasure. Um, this, so I thought ITAR was this, you know, nebulous kind of confusing type of CUI or similar to CUI and you've made it much more clear in my mind. So I, I really appreciate um, all of your knowledge and, and time here. My pleasure.